Welcome to another edition of Friends in the Business with me, Jennifer English, brought to you by the 49ers Golf and Country Club and the fabulous Rincon Mountain Grill. Welcome to the City of Gastronomy. This is Friends in the Business. Hi, everybody. I'm Jennifer English, and welcome to Tucson, Arizona, where we are with some of the finest restaurateurs in the world. As we celebrate end of the year, we're looking forward, and it's time for 2020 Food Trends. In the studio with me today, I'm going to have two of my all-time favorites. We looked at the global food trends in the hospitality industry. And from a B2B standpoint, well, you got to remember, each and every week, we invite our friends in the business. You know how good it is to have friends in the business? You know, the kind of people who are insiders. They've got all the information about how to get the best deals on a car. If you want to get the best information about, you know, which washing machine or or. You, you go to people who know, you go to the experts. If you're traveling to a city and you want to know the best restaurants to go to, you reach out to friends who've been there and know, or you look at the guidebooks. We rely on our friends to tell us the things that give us that insider's best track to getting the absolute best. So here's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about where we think the world is going. We're looking in our crystal ball. And to look in the crystal ball of what's going to happen in the hospitality industry globally, we reached out to a number of experts. And we produced a story in this month's edition of Food and Beverage Magazine. You can find it online at Food and Beverage Magazine or FB101.com. And of those trends, we picked a couple in particular that we think are going to be really powerful, important everywhere. And then we're going to talk about how those very trends are taking shape and actually influencing national trends right here from Tucson, Arizona by guys in the business, friends of mine who've come into the studio with me today to talk about what it means to be doing something so well and expertly and with such vision and creativity, with intention and inspiration that they're part of a national trend. We can shine a spotlight on our friends in the business who are doing this. And then as your friends in the business will tell you, hey, you know where I think you should really go and check this out? Well, that's where we're going today. First off, I'm going to introduce you to my friend, Chef Gordon Berger. Now, when you see his name spelled out, it's B-E-R-G-E-R, -E and some people might say Gordon Berger, but that's not really <laughs> what it's all about. Because when we're talking about the 2020 food trends, one of the most really interesting ones to me is the relationship we all have, no matter what the food trend is, to where we all come from. And of course, where all cuisine comes from in that great cuisine sense is Escoffier. And so we're going to talk with our friend Gordon Berger from Le Rendezvous Restaurant in Tucson. And then another food trend that's happening this year is a trend that's actually been happening for the past several cycles or seasons, and that's ramen. Everyone has discovered the joy and pleasure of ramen. It was really incredibly highlighted, maybe reinvented by David Chang, the James Beard renowned chef and creator of Momofuku in New York. You know, a lot of us grew up with the idea of ramen being those packaged eight for a dollar fried noodles that you would add hot boiling water to let sit for a minute or two and then you'd have a meal. That's about as far away from ramen's reality as you can possibly be. Today, ramen is being reimagined. Much in the same way, any base cuisine could be reimagined. Think of it like, like with a sandwich. You can turn it into anything. And so what chefs are doing across the country and around the globe is they're, they're reimagining ramen. Not going too far in some instances and in other instances going in remarkably original, bright, fresh, delicious directions. Ramen, as one of the trends, continues to roll on. It's the companion to the dumpling craze. And when I say dumplings, I want you to think Asia, not Iowa. Don't think granny's dumplings as in chicken and dumplings. I want you to think about things like bao and the idea of the soup dumplings that are hitting Las Vegas and making a big splash. So with all of that as a setup, with my friends in the business in the studio with me, I say welcome. I'm glad you're here with us. And if you want to, you can always join us by email. Just send me a little tap, tap, tap to spiritskitchen at gmail.com. So here we are. I'm going to start with my biggest trend of the year, better. Because the better trend, which is one of the trends of the 2020 food trends, is that we're all searching for better. 
better ingredients, better results, better everything, better better dishes, better better inspirations. You can eat better at every level, everywhere, because in the year to come, you're going to find people that are really going to make an effort to make everything they make, frankly, better. And the reason that these two chefs are in the studio with me today is because they both exemplify how you take something that is a classic cuisine and make it even better. I watched firsthand as Chef Gordon Berger at Le Rendezvous Restaurant in Tucson, Arizona, has done this very thing. Every day, I watch him quest to achieve better. He joins me, and I am really Really honored and proud to welcome him to my table. How are you? Thank you, Jennifer. I'm good. Thank you. Bonjour. Bonjour. <laughs> I love the idea that ooh la la, that classic idea of that reaction you get when you taste something remarkably delicious in that French tradition, that, that ooh la la, that luxury, that sumptuousness, that deliciousness that's often found in really simple dishes is alive and well and living in Tucson at Les Rendezvous. Let's go back to 1980 or somewhere in the 80s when your family started the restaurant. Take us there. Um, well, they had just moved uh, from Chicago, and um, I believe my father was working at uh, uh, Westward Luck or something, I guess, at Major D. And um, he also worked for this uh, this other like French restaurant, I believe. And I remember he got fired because he refused to use oil. He was always using butter. <laughs> <laughs> he was using too much butter, so. Um, Anyway, they they found this house for, where we're located now in Fort Lowell, Navarron, and um, his uh, his parents actually bought it and then they transformed it into a business. They, since it was zoned, they were like, "Let's do it." My dad, dad's very entrepreneurial, and you know he's always looking to start some business. And he wanted me to open a restaurant in Mexico at one point. Um, he's uh, he's always he's always thinking of something. Um, but anyway, so they so they started it, and uh, my grandparents worked there as well. My grandfather was like a sommelier. He oh, didn't wow. even speak English at all, and he would just point to the wines people were supposed to to drink. <laughs> and uh, a well, you carry that tradition on. I've watched you select wines for your guests as well. There's something yeah. about it. Talk about the um, philosophy of hospitality and the philosophy of flavor that's part of your family's tradition. Mm, um, well, I mean. I mean, my father was the cook, not my mother. And, um, but, you know, I mean, he's just, he was raised, he went to cooking school. His, his mother was a great chef too. And, um, so, you know, we do all this traditional stuff like, uh, sauerkraut, and, um, you know. What region of France is your family from? Um, Eastern France, like near Alsace Lorraine region. Hence the sauerkraut. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really great tradition. Talk about, your attitude and philosophy about guests and welcoming guests and hospitality. Uh, I mean, the guests are kings, but you know, when they come in, you know, you treat them like, like royalty. I mean, you, you, you see them where they want to sit. You, you give them prompt service. You, you know, you tell them what's good, and, and you make sure they're happy. I mean, I mean, I love to give them a great meal, and and then they come and they tell me how great it was. And, I watch people. Yeah. I've seen people when I've been there. I've seen you bring food to life. Really classic cuisine. Things like French onion soup gratiné, bouillabaisse, duck. You really have a sense of a classic cuisine that has its roots in the traditions of Escoffier. And I really believe that across the board, almost every cuisine in the world, especially every cuisine in North America, owes something to the traditions of Escoffier because it was sort of there that the idea of what food should be and the excellence and the care, the ingredient driven, the quality driven, the guest forward, those ideas, those Escoffier ideas are things that you bring to life. Will you talk a little bit about how that connection to the past kind of gets reimagined in a modern day? Um. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, when you study like French cooking, you see like, you know, the sauces are called like the mother sauces. I mean, I, I feel like, yeah, it's the basis of all other cooking. I mean, I, I mean, other people were doing it, I think, but maybe not to the extent the French were doing it and the French, you know, named everything and categorized everything and, you know, you know, they made a science and an art out of it. And even if you don't talk about the food per se, 
the way the brigade system in a kitchen works and the way oh, the yeah, chefs and the, and the way it's all broken down. I mean, so much of everything that exists in the hospitality industry and professional kitchens has, you can go to any kitchen, even a McDonald's, and you're going to find something <laughs> that you can tie back to a Scoffier and to French food. So there really is that sort of like, yeah. you're like the Adam and Eve of cuisine, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I think weren't the first restaurants in France too. I think they, they might've been. So, I mean, that probably worked, but yeah, I mean, it's, I guess that's the way they were. There was kind of military in their, in their execution. I mean, imagine if the restaurant started in Germany, it must, it would have been even more. Yeah. <laughs> Can you more imagine a chef telling yeah. you to do something again? <laughs> but, um, I mean, they've, they're really, it's very organized and I'm, I worked in a French Christian and, um, it was, I mean, it was very much like that. The brigade system, like the, you know, when the chef was around, you didn't talk, you just do your job and he kind of made sure you were doing things right. And he was polite, but you don't screw up, you know, <laughs> you, you were scared, really scared. Um, Let's talk a little bit about how the, the category of 2020 food trends, those emerging trends, uh, are, are going to lead us to look at some of those really essential elements of French cuisine that you offer at Les Rendezvous that are being discovered by a new generation. The point that I was trying to make is that while people say we don't eat like that anymore, like three course meals and formal mm -hmm. dining, the fact is you're really busy and people come there exactly for this kind of cuisine for this reason. Yeah. Well, I think it's partially because we're one of the last few restaurants like that in Tucson. Um, but yeah, but also I think you're right. I think it, it is being re-examined and re-discovered you know, discovered by the younger generation. And You get a lot of younger people coming to your restaurant. Uh, yeah, and it hasn't, I mean, I mean, I wouldn't say the majority of them are, but um, definitely more than before, and yeah, you can you can tell. And like, do you think that's something we can attribute to things like Food Network, or maybe, are these just yeah. a generation of millennials-driven generation of food lovers and foodies? I think so. I, I mean, I, we get like, you know, we get students from uh, from overseas that are here, and they come to the restaurant, and, and, they, and you ask them what they'd like from the menu, and they show you a picture of on their phone. <laughs> like, okay. Oh, that's the that. duck. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's talk about the uh, other trend of better because we're going to incorporate Chef Roberto Ortiz from the Yoshimatsu restaurant who's going to be joining us and we're going to sort of s expand our horizon in this category. Um, Chef Roberto Ortiz from Yoshimatsu, welcome to the table. Thanks. Thank you so much Thanks for, for having being me here. here. Both of you, both three of you. How's and everybody? you brought your sous chef with you, which yeah, I, I did. I'm very happy yeah. you did. I got my, I work, you know, as a chef, we work a lot of hours, so today's my only day off. So I brought Little Man with me. That's mm -hmm. awesome. I'm so glad he's here. His name is Gabriel. Here. Thank That's you for awesome. introducing him. <laughs> hey, listen, I, I want to ask uh, you and both uh, Gordon this question about better. And before we start talking about Yoshimatsu, which is really perennially chosen as the best Japanese restaurant. Yeah, we were voted in uh, Tucson Weekly. Again, 2019, yes. 2018, go back. Yes. Uh, the qualities there, I love Yoshi as a per like, yeah, I love the whole, the whole thing. But I want to talk about better, because I see it in everything that I watch both of you do. And I watch you closely because I really adore both of your places, and I respect you both as, as professionals. And Thank you for I, that. I want to talk to you. How are you seeing the expectation of guests drive you in that quest for better or is that just something you do as a chef naturally and it just happens to dovetail with the fact that people everywhere seem to be stepping up their game well i don't know it's a little different for me i mean he's coming from a, a family restaurant he's coming from a family restaurant so he, he has to maintain it yeah. and, and elevate it even more than what his father did and the same thing with me i'm she's been in business for 17 years so i'm basically trying to keep it at the same level and just introduce new things, make it better. And I think people uh, don't expect, they expect more because food is so much more out there. Food Network, you got foodies, you got everybody who tastes a little food automatically, I wouldn't say becomes a chef, but they, you know, I, I hear a lot of people at the restaurant, they're eating and they're like, oh, there's some spice in this and I wonder what it is, you know? Yeah. And then like, I hear them and I go, oh, that's a, the ginger in there or something like that. And they're like, oh, okay. And they always ask you questions, how you cook it and all that stuff. So, but I've always worked hard and I've always, I've only been in the business six years and I've, I think I've got to a place where most people it takes more than 10 years to get 
And I think it's just because I work hard. I listen. I absorb everything from a chef that knows more than me. I just So your whole it. career is a quest for better. Yeah, because it's actually the first time in my life that I've done something that I love. And I actually know what it means to when you go to work, it's not really going to work. And I, I love work and I love dealing with the customers, making them happy, seeing them come in, seeing them take a picture of the food. And they're like, oh, this is amazing. What is this? What did you put in it? How did you cook it? And then, you, you know, you talk to them because I'm very much as you've been to the restaurant as well, very much into hospitality. I feel like restaurants are losing that. It's more like you come in and then you eat and you're like, this is delicious. Like every night I, I walk the tables, you know, I cook as well. I, I still I run the restaurant. I still cook. I do sushi. I try to do everything. So my face is always seen. So they so they like, OK, this person is always here because a lot of times you can go to a restaurant and eat a dish. And then the next day eat the same dish and it's different. You're like, oh, that's a different chef today. You know what I mean? Because consistency is also very important in the business, correct? Yeah. yeah. You know, so. Well, and that's part yeah. of the thing. I strive for that, but. <laughs> yeah, it's very hard. It's hard. Yeah. It's very, very hard, you know. Gordon, how, how do you how do you respond to this idea of better? Is it just something that you naturally quest for? Or are you are you driven by the fact that you're getting more sophisticated customers that were, you know, educated and inspired by Food Network? People are taking pictures of your food with their phone. They're posting pictures. How does all that factor into your quest for better? Well, I mean, I'm trying to. I'm not, I'm always, I don't know how to say it. Like, um, I feel like my cuisine is, is, I don't, I mean, I don't want to be like presumptuous to say is the best, but I mean, I want it to be like the best and I want to maintain it to be the best. So I've always got to strive to do it the best. So I can't, I can't sit on my laurels and just, you know. Just because it was great yesterday doesn't mean right, it's going to exactly. be great tomorrow. <laughs> so you got to come in and work even harder than the day before. And, and there going. are things like, that you do particularly brilliantly well. You have a Vichy Soise on your menu mm. that is one of the best I've ever had. You have a French onion soup gratiné on the menu. One of the best, it's the best in town, I will say that. Simple things that when you taste them are so expertly prepared that they are the quint they're the essence of what that dish is supposed to be. You do that exceptionally well and it's consistent from day to day. So I'll, I'll report, you're having a, on your report card, you get an A plus in that consistency. <laughs> Uh, realm. One of the things um, in that idea that I wanted to ask you about, in terms of the actual cuisine itself, things that are so irresistible that when you put a bite in your mouth, you are you are having a profound human reaction experience to how delicious it is. Talk to me about things like that demi glace that you put on the mini beef Wellington on your small plates menu. That small plates menu to me is one of those areas where you take the old and the new and you put them together. You take something as essential as beef Wellington, but you offer it on a small plate for under $10 and you offer it in the bistro versus the main dining room and you offer it with some demi glace, which is one of those fantastic mother sauces that is rare to find and, and you do it so well. Talk about why something like that can even exist today and how you came to create the small plates menu and what that actually represents. Um, well, the small plates menu was created to to uh, attract a, a newer crowd and younger crowd. Um, I mean, I knew, I knew that um, small plates on the East Coast were, were really a hit and it wasn't something that was around here. And so I wanted to, uh, yeah, infuse a little fun and because it, it's really it's really uh communal to to sit there and eat small plates it's kind of like uh chinese dim sum or something you know? yeah i love that idea everyone shares them even though they're small i mean they're still shareable and and they're fun and they're they're cute they're just the fact that they're small makes them you know attractive as well but having something like a demi glace on your menu that you put on a couple of different dishes mm -hmm. and you have a you have a irresistible recipe you ensure that it's irresistible in its execution every single day. Yeah, I, try. I mean, I try to. I mean, and it's because we've been doing it for so long, myself and the French in general, <laughs> that, um, you know, I've been tasting my demi glaze every day for, you know, the last 10 years. And so I'm always, you know, I know what it's supposed to taste like and I know what's good. And I know and I w if I find something to make it better, you know, I'll give it a shot. So the... The other thing you do particularly well are the, are the souffles. And I don't know the last time anybody had a souffle, but 
it's the kind of thing like you have you have steak frites on the menu. I don't know who even does steak frites in town, but you, you've got the best steak frites in town. Like it's hard dish to find, but it's a simple dish. If anyone knows, that's you. I don't know. I don't. I don't go out to enough restaurants as I wish I could, or as I did <laughs> when I was younger. But <laughs> um, I, maybe there are. I'm sure there's got to be someone doing steak frites. But um, but yeah, we we do. You know, we do it with uh, flat iron steak, so it's. It's not as expensive as a, a filet mignon or anything, but um, it's a nice tender meat and um, it's delicious. Try to cook it, and you hand cut fries in the house. Hand cut the fries. There's some of the best fries in town. I'll tell you, you get an A plus on the frites. Uh, yeah, I know. Um, I want to come back to um, at Le Rendezvous the idea that when you're doing something so quintessentially French and really simple, like a steak frite, like a Vichy soise or demi glace. I want to remind people, like with a souffle, what what is a souffle? I mean, we've heard it. We kind of know that you, if you mess around too much, that that it could fall or collapse. <laughs> but but I don't think most people know how to make them, and what they are, and what, if anybody's even had it before. If they haven't had it, it sounds like ultra fancy. Um, but it's also really kind of simple. Will you tell us about what a souffle is? I mean, it's uh, it's like it's like the magic of an egg. I mean, it's mostly eggs. It's a, you make a custard with uh, the yolks and sugar, and we use um, some little orange liqueur. Uh, so we make a custard as the base, and then you whip the whites and make a meringue, and you fold the two together, and uh, you know you line your ramekin with sugar and, and butter, bake it at the right temperature for the right amount of time. I mean, whip the egg whites for the exact right amount of time as well. It's all technique. And it comes out, yeah. I mean, once you got it, it's easy, but... If you don't, if you if you make any little variation, it's not going to come out right. You know what it reminds me of? It's like a making a biscuit, the American Southern cuisine. People that know how to make a biscuit will tell you, oh, that's just the easiest, simplest thing you could ever make. And if you don't know how to make a biscuit or if you don't have the right um, temperature in your hands and your fingers, that if you try and make a biscuit, it can be a really hard thing. Yeah. I'm a lousy biscuit maker and I've had some of the best in the business try and show me how. I've thrown in the towel on that one. <laughs> I will always keep trying, but. My fingers don't want to make biscuits. But it's, again, it's it's simple if you know how to do it. Right. And once you know how to but, do and it. And it's very elegant. I mean, it's very, it's it's elegant because, I mean, it, it's it's dramatic, the, you know, the change because of the, because it's a foam, it, you know, expands. It's yeah. ooh-la-la. Yeah. <laughs> and I know that we're going to be taking a break in a couple of minutes. Uh, but before we do, I, I want to tie it all together. The reason I have you both on on the same show is because I think there are a lot of similarities between classic Japanese cuisine and classic French cuisine, that there are some really essential elements to Japanese cuisine and French cuisine where you could really understand what each other does. The ingredients might be different, but the ideas and the intentions behind them are the same. There's something very similar about a ramen broth. It's a very simple thing to make, and yet Japanese chefs might spend... 25 years trying to perfect their ramen broth. The broth is everything. French onion soup, the broth is everything. The demi glace, it's a simple sauce. It's everything. There's a real similarity, and I and I want to give you each the opportunity to sort of talk about do you see do you see the common thread between your cuisines? Do you see the common intention behind the cooking behind both your cuisines? Well, I was taught French style. So oh. <laughs> yeah, I went to culinary school. And- was French style, the Japanese. Uh, it's it's simple. It's simplicity too, as yeah. well. Yeah. You know, I, I I'm I'm into that as well because I think if you just keep it simple, the ingredients are more powerful. The person will love it more. Yeah. I I, I don't like to be one of these chefs that add like thirty thousand things to a dish. I like to just keep it simple and let the flavor speak for itself. Yeah, I love that too. Yeah, I mean I. I mean, I've heard stories and read read a little bit about um, Japanese food, and I remember reading about that um, that sushi place where you have to like book like three years in advance, and it costs a fortune to go there. And and it's just all oh, the one in Japan, yeah, the hero, right? right? Yeah. yeah, I think that's yeah, the one. Yeah, he he closed his restaurant. And oh, really? Now he's just doing like private stuff, and they actually the, they took his Michelin stars away, and his son had to start all over. Why? Oh. He just he was old. He was eighty something. He was years old. old. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. You know, and I, I mean, think in, in that also in that culture, he's like, "All right, I made it. I'm not just going to hand it to you. You need to make it yourself." Wow. Also, you know what I mean. Yeah. So, which really is not 
here in the States, you know what I mean? Everything is basically handed. Like your family, not saying they handed to you, but you, you had to make your own bones before they were like, okay, you can take the reins. Right. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Well, he'd been working there. You've been working there since you were a kid. I've yeah. been working yeah, there for a long time. Yeah. And I, and always I, been a chef. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because your family's been and you've been in that environment. Well, I worked stuff. in the front of the house for a long time before I finally got into the back. But, but that was a while ago. Um, but yeah, as we were saying, like the, the dedication, I see the dedication they put in. And I mean, waking up every day. I mean, remember the guy would like, wouldn't even go to a weddings or funerals. He would, he'd always be at work. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you're the same, the right? Tonight, I, I, I'm right? the same. I'm I'm there open to close almost every day. <laughs> on my days off, if they call me, I'm with my family. Oh, I'll be back in two hours. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's, uh, no one's going to maintain it like you. Yeah. Right. You know what I mean? They may love their job. They may love cooking. But I think it's just something different. Like when I walk in there in the morning and everything's off and I turn everything on, it's, I'm so happy. <laughs> it's a weird feeling, you know what I mean? And then get the fire going, get the stock going, get everything going. And knowing I'm preparing myself for service, you know, even prepping is even prepping is important. You know what I mean? Hey, let's talk a little bit about what it means to cook in Tucson. What it means? Like uh, in terms of what? And by the way, I want to remind you, you are listening to Friends in the Business. I'm Jennifer English, your hostess, and I'm here at my table with two, three extraordinary friends, Chef Gordon Berger from Le Rendezvous Restaurant in Tucson, Arizona, where ooh la la, the essence of French cuisine is alive and well. And my good friend, Chef Roberto Ortiz from Yoshi Matsu Restaurant and Maru Noodle Bar, talking about ramen noodles as ramen rolls on and the essentials of French cuisine are all part of our 2020 food trends. We'll be right back. I'm Sabrina Rigas from the Urban Grove in Tucson, Arizona. You are listening to Friends in the Business with my friend, Jennifer English. So we're, we're back. I want to um, give uh, Chef Roberta the chance. There's a lovely little piece of cake on that table that I was want to make sure that you could get, Gabriel. We are so happy to be here in the studio with uh, Chef Gordon Berger from Le Rendezvous Restaurant in Tucson, Arizona, and Chef Roberto Ortiz from Yoshimatsu. Talking about t trends, 2020 food trends. Try saying that three times fast. In 2020, the kinds of things that we're going to see taste and experience together include an array of different food experiences and dining experiences. You're going to see things that we'll talk about a little later in the show, like pranic foods. Mexican cuisine is much more than a taco, focusing on the Sonoran and Oaxaca regions. But the two big trends we're focusing on with my guests in studio are ramen rolling on, because ramen has been a big thing for a long time, and the essentials of French cuisine are alive and well. Chef Roberto Ortiz from Yoshimatsu and Maru, the sister restaurant, the companion restaurant on the west side of town, the second restaurant in the Yoshimatsu family, specializes in ramen. You are the ramen king in town. Let's talk a little bit no. about ramen. <laughs> okay, what do you want to talk about? Tell me about how you're reimagining ramen. I wouldn't say re reimagining it. Uh, as I was talking to my uh, Yoshimi before, the owner of the restaurant, I said, I want to keep it Japanese 99.9999%, but I want to introduce some some American influence into it so we can fusion it. Like, uh, we just introduced uh, a duck ramen on Friday. So it has a seared duck because we don't have an oven in, in house. So we have to cook it in a cast iron pan. I've been cooking it like that. And then it comes with uh, cranberry sauce and it comes with uh, apples cooked in duck fat. And then it also has uh, sautéed mushrooms. Everything's cooked separate and then put together as in French style. And then uh, has the ramen shoyu base. And uh, then we put the, the duck fat on top of it. And uh, she had put it on uh, in, uh, Facebook on Friday. And it was already 42 likes and like 12 comments. And we went through one case of duck on Friday and Saturday. So I had to buy two more of the cases. <laughs> so... And I want to say that last uh, month you did Thanksgiving. Yeah, I did a turkey ramen with a deep fried, uh, deep fried uh, tempura uh, stuffing. It was like a tempura stuffing fritter. It was yeah, like so a fritter. Yeah, we, we we I cooked it initially with the the bones of the turkey, and then you know put the. It was sensational. 
Yeah, it, it was still eating it. It was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> it was really, really delicious, yeah. that sage stuffing. What's the key to ramen that you can use to explain why it continues to be one of the most influential hospitality industry food trends nationally and even here in Tucson? I it's not like we have a giant Japanese community No, here. we don't. I mean, there's a ramen shop down the street, and there's one across the street. And, I mean, they're doing okay. They're but proliferating. We're, but, we're, but we're busy every day. You know what I mean? And I think it's just because we're, we're consistent in our food. You know, customers come in. They, you know, I know them by name. I give them hugs. You know, they come in for a whole different experience when, when, when they come there. And we all try to give it to them from me to the server to the other line cooks and to the sushi chefs, you know. And tell us about Maru, the second restaurant. Yoshimatsu started on one side of Campbell Avenue. Then they grew and they went across the street and they grew and then they went back across the street. And in, now in its third location, they've spun off to a second location after 15 years or so. What's the secret at Yoshimatsu? And tell us about how and what Maru is. Well, Maru is a, a sister restaurant of uh, Yoshimatsu. But there they just do ramen. So uh, essentially, Yoshimatsu is more of a fine dining. And Maru is more like a, we call it like a turn and burn. So they come in, they eat the ramen quickly, and then they... And that sounds almost there. Japanese style, where it's like kind of no frills and all about what's in the bowl. Yeah, all it is is just the, the ramen. They have, um, we have a couple of curry dishes. They have more curry dishes over there and uh, more, more ramen. Uh, but the ramens are different. I mean, we have some of the, like the tantan man, which is uh, the ground pork, very spicy uh, ramen we have in both places. But initially, she's trying to keep that different, but the same. So we're going to say thank you so much for coming okay, in. Okay, I appreciate it. And uh, remind everybody where Yoshimatsu and Maru are located. Yoshimatsu is 2741 North Campbell Avenue. And, I don't and, know and Maru's on the west side of on town. On the west side, off of uh, Silver Bell. Yeah, we'll get you that address. Thanks an awful lot, guys, for coming uh, in. Okay. So... And we turn around back to my friend uh, Gordon Berger from Le Rendezvous Restaurant. Now, have you, when's the last time you had a bowl of ramen? Because you actually are a really interesting cat because you are a vegetarian. <laughs> yeah. I, w <laughs> I didn't know if we were going to talk about that. Yeah. Uh, well, I was, I was going to weave it in, see how I went to Japan. And I, I talked a little bit about that. And I'm trying to get back to that sort of like healthy. And one of the other trends is prana or pranic foods. And pranic foods are high energy foods that increase and enhance the vitality and the energy. Prana is life energy. And the life energy that we derive from the foods that we eat are the things that you focus on. And when you start really focusing on the energy of the food that you eat and the vitality of the cuisine, um, a lot of people have given up sort of, first they gave up sort of factory meat, industry, food industry complex meat. And then they gave up even the organic locally produced stuff. Uh, how, what was your journey to vegetarianism like? And is it is it energy based? Is it life and, you know, sort of? Uh, I mean, yeah, that's definitely one of the benefits I've, I've seen. I mean, I feel I feel healthier. Um, but for me, it's like a uh, consciousness for the earth you know like yeah. we're worried about the environment you know seeing the carbon footprint that goes into making all this meat and it's just not sustainable so i'm doing my small part by not eating meat but i mean i'm still i still serve a lot of meat and you know but you did it because it makes you feel better yeah and, I, and your effort is to make you know the world better everything better mm -hmm. we're all paying attention to mother earth in different ways than we did before mm -hmm. um when we talk about things that are simple things, there's something great about Japanese cuisine because many of the broths are not a meat-based broth. Yeah. Do you do you incorporate a lot of Japanese or Asian foods into your diet and and your food planning personally, apart from the restaurant? Um. No, I mean I do love ramen. You mentioned it was, I was. It's been a while, but I do I do love it a lot. And um, you know, I'll, anything noodles I, I love too. Um. Like the what is it called? The Japanese uh, noodle dish. It's like yoki saba. Or yeah, yoki saba. Yeah. Um, as far as Asian food, um, are you like a dumpling guy, or because dumplings oftentimes will have a like little a lot bit of, of meat. ginger? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I avoid, I avoid meat, but I mean, I'll always, I'll taste. I mean, I taste everything. If, and if someone makes me a, a dish, I mean, I'll eat it no matter what. Okay, so l- let's talk about French cuisine. Where's French cuisine going, and where's Yoshi? Uh, where is um, Le Rendezvous going, cuisine wise, with these essentials? Um, where are we all going in terms of fine dining? Is fine dining changing? Are you seeing it change? Uh, I mean, it's getting more scarce, definitely. Um, so the ones that are here are, are appreciated. I think people are That's, happy to still have something, but I think it is going away. Yeah. I mean, what can we do to preserve it? Come to rendezvous. <laughs> no, I mean, you laugh, but I, that's what I say, too. <laughs> if somebody were coming to Le Rendezvous for the first time, because I should, I should disclose that I've been a customer for a long time. I went there at least twice a year with my very dear friend, Ellen Burke Van Slyke. And listeners will remember that Ellen Burke Van Slyke was the director of food and beverage for Lowe's Hotels. She was also the owner at one point of a restaurant that was beloved in Tucson called Bocata. And we would go to Le Rendezvous and we would have a ladies luncheon together and we'd sit and talk. There is something about Le Rendezvous that is transportive. It's an environment that you've created in the front in the bistro, you really just take a short vacation to another place altogether. The vibe and the energy, but more than anything else, the conviviality. You might sit down there and you might have lunch by yourself. And I've seen people have lunch or dinner by themselves there. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of place where you feel extremely comfortable to do that because in the French tradition, that's what people do. I've seen people make friends with the people at the next table and end up blending their parties together. You create incredible conviviality there that is, I think, even more rare than the cuisine that you offer. And then in the back, in the fine dining, there are tablecloths. It's set up in what we all commonly recognize as a very nice restaurant. It's one of the last fine restaurants in town. And in an era where people are not eating like this anymore, proclaiming, I don't eat like that anymore, changing the way they think about it, The one thing we don't want to change is what we get from dining out in general. The fact is we could go on, you know, DoorDash and get any cuisine in the world from any restaurant in town brought to our house. Mm. You can get stuff delivered. Why do we still go out? And when we go out, why do we go to places like Le Rendezvous? Because they offer us something special. How do you answer somebody that says, I can get anything delivered. Why would I want to go out? Uh, uh, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, you, people go out because, you know, they want to see other people. They they want to be seen. They um, they want to experience the, you know, the pleasure of eating and the food and that, and that atmosphere that um, the restaurateur has created for them. I mean, it's like all about um, context. So you kind of put yourself, surround yourself with all the things that are going to embellish the food even, even more. And conviviality matters. Yeah, absolutely. And you do a brilliant job of creating conviviality at Le Rendezvous. Thank you. Listen, I want to say thank you for coming and being with us today. I know you've got to get back because I know today's your day off and you've got to go pick up all your proteins and and goodies (laughs) and stuff. But uh, I wanted to thank you for coming and talking about trends. And before I let you go, I wanted to ask you because you grew up in the business and you have your own crystal ball about where things go next. What does your crystal ball tell you about the food trends for 2020? What do you see in your crystal ball? What do you predict? Um, that's a good question. Um, Cause you get all your sales reps coming in. You, you see things being brought to you. Yeah, well, more the wine reps. I see a lot more wine reps than I do food reps. Um, but as far as food, food, I mean, it's it's hard because in Tucson you don't get as much as the produce and stuff you would, that you see like on all these food channels and like all the nice restaurants, you know, East Coast and West Coast, like New York. And, but um, I think all that stuff kind of slowly makes itself more available to us, and um, so we should be looking forward to some of those items like the ramps and the yeah. fiddleheads and, and all that stuff. So my last question to you as my friend in the business, as our friend in the French cuisine business in Tucson, Arizona, 
teach us how to get the best experience. How to, what are your tips for having the best experience at Le Rendezvous? How do we come in and take advantage of everything you have to offer to have the ultimate ooh la la? What's your advice? Uh, I mean, come with, so, come with someone you lo- love, you know, that you want to, that you love, that you want to have a great conversation with um, and take your time and, you know, start small with the small plates and, and then absolutely end with the dessert, like the souffle. And, you know, you don't have to, you know, get a four course meal or anything, but uh, just take your time and enjoy it. Gordon Berger from Le Rendezvous. Tell everybody where you're located and where your website is and where you are on Facebook so that they can make reservations because like all great classic French restaurant um, aspects, reservations are recommended. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, let's see. We're located on Fort Lowell and Alvernon. Um, it's 3844 East Fort Lowell. And um, our website is rendezvoustucson.com. And um, the Rendezvous Facebook. Yeah. And you guys celebrate that you have regulars. And you have more regulars than almost any other restaurant I've ever encountered in Tucson. Really? And you treat your regulars really, really well. You reward your regulars with the kind of relationship that is developed and, and fostered and enriched. Um, and I want to compliment you for that. I also want to talk about the fact that when people come and celebrate an anniversary or birthday, you send a creme brulee with a little birthday candle. You, you, you want people to tell you about the special occasions they're coming to celebrate. Talk a little bit about how in this era, when we've gotten less and less training to do this with the restaurants we go to, how you can remind us not to feel shy or uncomfortable about asking not even asking. We're not asking for anything when we call you. It's like you want to know that we're having a special occasion because you want to do things for us. Yeah, I want to celebrate with you. You know, want to make it special. Um, I mean, yeah, that, that's that's the perfect setting for a celebration. You know, only rendezvous where ooh la la is alive and well in Tucson, Arizona. I want to thank you for being here with us. So as we look at the 2020 food trends and we look at some of the other trends that are taking place, we can't help but recognize that in Tucson, Arizona, we have two of the greatest spas in the world for almost 20, 25 years. Canyon Ranch and Miraval were combining one and two, number one in the world, number two in the world. Uh, People come from all over the world to have that healing, restorative energy that is found at Canyon Ranch and Miraval. And the things that they do cuisine-wise, historically, when you said spa food, you imagined, you know, foregoing a glass of wine and uh, sitting and maybe getting a, a plate of carrot sticks or having some other kind of spa food, meaning you were trying to diet or you're trying to lose weight. Spa food has become its own category of wonderful cuisine in its own right, thanks to some of the chefs at our favorite places. Canyon Ranch has at the helm these days, Chef Russell Michel, himself a longtime veteran of the cuisine scene in Tucson, Arizona, where he was uh, one of the executives at the La Paloma Golf and Country Club, La Paloma Resort. And what's happening at Canyon Ranch that's really interesting and nationally trend driving is the kind of cuisine, yes, better is one of the trends that he is absolutely taking to the next level. He's reimagined the menus and locals can go for a spa day at a local's rate that includes a luncheon. And if you want to have some of the kind of world-class food that people from all over the world come to Tucson to experience, go to Canyon Ranch, go for a day and experience the spa cuisine of Chef Russell Michelle. But even more than that, It also leads into the next category and was kind of the lead category of food trends that we wrote about this year. And that's prana. And the idea of prana or pranic, P-R-A-N-A or P-R-A-N-I-C. Prana and pranic foods are foods that enhance the energy and vitality or the life force. If you think about it, we are as human beings compilations of everything we've ever eaten, right? Everything we've ever sipped, 
everything we've ever consumed. And when you are conscientious about the kinds of things that you put into your body, it's because that's what you're choosing to make your body out of. And so when you think about how those food choices, you're making better food choices, or if you're going to a restaurant, you're going somewhere where the intention of the chef and the execution of the menu of the chef is done at such a high level, like it is at Le Rendezvous or at Yoshimatsu or at Maru restaurant, you are going to get something that you're very comfortable and happy making the decision to bring in. It gives you your energy. It gives you your vitality. Now, some foods over the last few years in terms of food cycles and food trends, this is a trend in itself, we're already on that pranic food list. So things that increase your vitality like gingers, uh, spices are a big trend. Spices enhance the vitality and the pranic energy. Foods that are the live foods as opposed to heavy meats. You know, heavy meats like pork and, and, and even beef, they're very low in the pranic energy, whereas foods that are still alive and vital and really charged with energy are things that when we eat them, we enhance our energy and we enhance the ability that we have to live with vibrancy. And so the idea behind pranic foods comes from the East, from Indian traditions. In Asian traditions, you might consider the word chi. Most cultures have some word that describes that life force, that energy, that spirit. When we choose foods and we're, we're, we're feeding our bodies and our minds, we're also feeding our souls and our spirits. And it's the energy that comes along with the food that feeds the spirit. Prana or pranic food is food that enhances the vitality and the robust energy and the vibration of the energy part. So when you watch Food Network and you see a chef like Emeril Lagasse talking about putting love in food and enhancing the food with his intention. I want you to imagine that all the energy you have every time you cook for yourself or your family is coming through you into the food as you transform the ingredients into a dish or you transform them from uncooked to cooked or from one to many. So this simple idea is one that as you go around and you look at the business of the hospitality business and you decide who is growing and thriving, expanding and enhancing in a robust way and, and what's kind of dying off, the things that are no longer robust are those things that are failing to satisfy those commercial or customer wants and wishes. And when we say commercial, it kind of almost seems like a, like it goes against the idea of a pranic food or an energy food. But the reality is there's a way we all live in a sustainable way. So the other aspect of this that's really important is the sustainability of it. And when you look at the great cuisines of the world, whether it's an Asian cuisine where they never waste anything because if you didn't have much, you never wasted anything, or French cuisine where there are very few scraps that don't get used for something else, we learn the lesson of sustainability and we apply it moving forward into the 2020 food trends as well. I'm going to grab this, hang on, piece of paper right there. And I'm going to suggest that as we're looking at Food and Beverage Magazine for the December issue, and we're looking at our food trends, I want to also talk about something that is another really essential element of cuisine. And that's the idea of fire. More and more, you will look at cooking shows and how they're deriving their inspiration from what people want. Barbecue is a big thing. Places like Ken's Hardwood Barbecue in Tucson, Arizona, Tito and Pep with Chef John Martinez. These are guys that actually cook with fire. And why is fire important? Well, for a long time, kitchens got really sanitized. And if you went back to the kitchens of Escoffier in that time, and then you went forward as modernity and in sort of invention and technology happened in kitchens. And you think of things like sous vide 
and sous vide, which was popular maybe five or six years ago, and, and you still see it happening. But the idea of sous vide is sort of the antithesis of the current food trend of fire. Fire is such a basic element, and, and a lot has been written about the pure essential quality of fire in the process of cooking. And it kind of is differentiated for us from one of those ideas that animals don't cook their food. We are the top of the food chain in part because we cook our food. It's just one of the many things, right? So, so think of this. If we are using fire to transform our food, think about how delicious something looks as it's braised over some coals with that gorgeous melting fat rendering out, or if it's doing something crisping, or if it's, if it's really primal, you get these flavors and tastes that don't come from any other source. That's going to be a really big thing in the next year. We here in Tucson, Arizona are in the heart of the Sonoran region. Our friends at Visit Tucson, Vamos a Tucson, visittucson.com.org, they'll tell you that the world is paying attention to the fact that we are a city of gastronomy. So as a city of gastronomy, what that means is the world is paying attention to what we have here because for 4,000 years we've been cultivating food in this region, growing food, making food. And if growing food and making food, it meant sharing food. It meant that we were not only cultivating the ingredients that became cuisine, but we were cultivating conviviality, hospitality, welcoming our friends, welcoming our neighbors, welcoming strangers, sharing what we had, bringing the core and essence of what it meant to be human and sharing the life experience through food with other people. So in this region, this Sonoran region, there was no border long ago. 4,000 years ago, it wasn't a border. So going all the way down into Sonora, to the coast, to the ocean, to the city of Hermosillo, into the hills where there is so much rich and robust produce, and on up through the Tucson area and the Tucson, greater Tucson area, we've got incredible food here. The world is taking notice, and over the next year, I think you're going to see a lot more of very regional-centric Mexican cuisine. We've been in love with the taco for the last five years, and it's gone everywhere. But we're going to get more specific, and in two regions in particular where I think we're going to see a lot of this is in the Sonoran region and in the region of Oaxaca. And what those things will be are beyond the taco, beyond the taco sauce. Chefs like Tucson's own Chef Maria Maison from Boca Tacos, located on historic 4th Avenue, well, she paints with a palette of flavors. As she said many, many times, anybody can make a taco, but it's the salsas that you dress the taco with that really transform them and elevate them. She is a practitioner of the fine art of tacos. And while she paints with a palette of flavors, if you are coming to town, she is one of the chefs I will urge you to go visit to really get a sense and flavor of this place and this region. And if you are from here and you haven't been down to historic 4th Avenue in a long time and you haven't tried Boca Tacos, I urge you to try them because it's utterly brilliant. It's truly the fine art of tacos. And then there's Chef David Solorzano. He's originally from the region of Jalisco, but he trained at the Cordon Bleu, and he's inspired by the region of Oaxaca. At Panka Restaurant at number 50 Broadway in Tucson, Arizona, you will see this amalgamation of classic French and classic Mexican and classic invention and intention from a talented young chef who does things like take a classic pasole and he does a white pasole, and he makes it with roast turkey. Chefs are imagining and reimagining, redesigning and recreating classic dishes like Chef Roberto Ortiz with his turkey ramen and Chef David Solorzano at Panca with turkey as the core ingredient in his pasole. These are ideas that are coming from Tucson, Arizona that really speak to 
national food trends. You want to know why we're the city of gastronomy? It's not just because UNESCO said so. It's because the things that happen here are truly organically inspired by the energy and the vitality and the invention of being here. There's something that inspires these chefs. Now, you can't be from Tucson or be here or visit here or dine here and ignore the fact that adventure cuisine, which was really given to us as a gift by the late Anthony Bourdain, his adventure cuisine is one of my 2020 food trends. Bourdain inspired us by example to try everything, to go places, to meet people, to try their food. This is inspiring us whenever we travel to eat different wherever we go. But this trend is inspiring a movement to start food adventures close to home. I will urge you, discover food worth traveling for, starting in your own neighborhood. Take this intrepid sense of search that you bring with you whenever you travel around the world. And, and let's say you're going to Ho Chi Minh City or you're going to Brooklyn for the best slice. I want you to take that quest for that best idea, dish, taste, I want to tell you somewhere in this town, in this region where we live, chances are someone is creating notable food, regional specialties, seasonal signature dishes, craft beer or bread, cocktails, cookies, gelato, gin, something that's going to be nationally worth discovering. And they're right here in Tucson. You want to know some of those places? Well, I can give you more names to try because I'm your friend in the business and I'll send you to my friends in the business. Two other things I really want to squeeze in before we're done. Of course, fermentation in all its forms is an ancient way of keeping foods. Kombuchas like wild tonic kombucha, but it's it's crossing over and hitting lots of categories. And you can find lots of really great fermentation examples all over town here in Tucson, Arizona. Luxury foods in the form of snack foods are coming on strong. And believe it or not, classic beans. When you think of Tucson, Arizona, yes, beans are a staple. But when we talk about heirloom beans, the kind of beans like the tepary beans we've been growing here for millennia, heirloom beans are finding their way back in as protein sources. More and more people are choosing pranic foods and high energy, energy rich foods, meat free, lesser meat, maybe meat free altogether uh, diet plans and food plans and food life. So when we talk about these heirloom beans, there are really, I'm a native Bostonian, so those native Boston baked beans and their sweet, rich, savory satisfaction with spices and molasses. But they were always an expression of Yankee frugality. Well, do yourself a favor and seek out some of the best heirloom beans at the farmer's markets like Five Points Farmer's Market and the Rito Farmer's Market. I think we're winding down. We've got how much? A couple seconds. Listen, with less than a minute to go, I want to encourage you all. You can find me on Facebook, Jennifer English, and you can email me at spiritskitchen at gmail.com. We had Chef bring his little boy here today with us, and that to me was the greatest gift because we are the custodians, the stewards of the future of food. When we talk about the future of food and we talk about trends, the most important future trend is the trend of sharing meals with your children. The most important trend this year Eat dinner with your kids. More good can happen from that than anything else. And when you get home tonight, I want you to do me this favor. Hug your kids and count your blessings. Thanks for listening. Cheers. Cheers.